Islam has some incredibly odd teachings, and I'm putting that mildly. But every once in a while, we come across a command that's so unbelievably absurd on so many levels. We can only wonder why Muhammad wasn't laughed out of Arabia when he delivered it to his followers. Take, for instance, Muhammad's solution to the following problem. Suppose a man and a woman, who aren't married to each other, need to be alone together for some reason. Perhaps the man is a household servant and the woman's husband goes away on business trips. How are the man and the woman, who aren't married to each other, supposed to avoid having sex? This problem was actually brought to Muhammad and Allah himself provided the solution. Allah, in his timeless wisdom, revealed in the Quran that in order to prevent any sort of illicit sexual encounter, the woman should breastfeed the grown man ten times. This will technically make the woman the man's foster mother, so they won't be tempted to have sex. Now, if you're thinking to yourself, ten breastfeedings, that's too much, don't worry, Allah has got you covered. Even though the Quran is supposedly Allah's eternal word, Allah eventually changed his eternal mind about the need for ten breastfeedings. Five, it turns out, is quite sufficient. Sahih Muslim, 3598. It was narrated from Amra that she heard Aisha say when she was mentioning what kind of breastfeeding makes a person a mahram. A mahram is a relative you're not allowed to marry or have sex with. Ten definite breastfeedings were revealed in the Quran, then five definite breastfeedings were revealed too. Notice that Aisha says these verses were revealed in the Quran. Let's read another. Sahih Muslim 3597. It was narrated that Aisha said, Among the things that were revealed of the Quran was that ten definite breastfeedings make a person a mahram. Then that was abrogated and replaced with five definite breastfeedings, and the Messenger of Allah passed away when this was among the things that were recited of the Quran. So Allah revealed two Quran verses about breastfeeding adults, one verse requiring ten breastfeedings, which was later abrogated by a second verse requiring five breastfeedings. Aisha specifically says that this was among the things that were recited of the Quran when Muhammad died. But you can read the Quran we have today until your brain falls out and you won't find either of these verses. So what happened to them? Well, Aisha tells us what happened to the first verse in Sunan Ibn Majah, 1944. It was narrated that Aisha said, the verse of stoning and of breastfeeding an adult ten times was revealed, and the paper was with me under my pillow. When the Messenger of Allah died, we were preoccupied with his death, and a tame sheep came in and ate it. The seventh century version of the dog ate my homework was apparently a sheep ate my Quran verses. That explains the disappearance of the verse requiring ten breastfeedings, but the other verse commanding five breastfeedings isn't in the Quran either. So we can only conclude that both verses on breastfeeding adults were eaten by Aisha's sheep. Now, was this a mere accident or was there something more sinister afoot? Let's see if we can solve the mystery of the missing verses. The case begins with a woman named Sahla, Sahih Muslim, 3600. It was narrated that Aisha said, Sahla bin Suhail came to the Prophet and said, O Messenger of Allah, I see signs of displeasure on the face of Abu Hudaifa, that was her husband, when Salim, who was his ally, comes in. The Prophet said, Breastfeed him. She said, How can I breastfeed him? He is a grown man. The Messenger of Allah smiled and said, I know that he is a grown man. Creepiest smile ever. So, Sahla's husband was concerned about this grown man being around his wife, and Muhammad's response was that she needed to put her breasts in the man's mouth repeatedly. Interestingly, Sahla did exactly what Muhammad and Allah commanded. She put her breasts in Salam's mouth so that he could suck on them over and over again, and this calmed her husband down. Why? Because he trusted Muhammad. Well, Muhammad and Allah say that if I just let this man suck on my wife's breast a bunch of times, I don't need to worry about what they do when I'm gone for the weekend. I feel so much better now that her nipples are in this guy's mouth. Anyone else want to hang out with my wife while I'm out of town? 
Come on over. Breasts for everyone, Allahu Akbar. For a while, at least, Muhammad's wives were on board with Allah's views on breastfeeding adults. When Muhammad's wife Hafsa wanted to spend time with a man, she would send the man to her sister to be breastfed. We read in Malik's Muwatta, chapter 30, section 1, number 8. Hafsa, Umm al muminin mother of the believers, sent Asim ibn Abdullah ibn Sa'd to her sister Fatima bin Umar ibn al-Khattab for her to suckle him ten times so that he could come in to see her. She did it so he used to come in to see her. Hafsa couldn't breastfeed Asim because she didn't have children, so she had her sister breastfeed him ten times, which transformed him into Hafsa's foster nephew. Eventually, however, most of Muhammad's wives, including Hafsa, became disgruntled over the practice. After retelling the story about Muhammad ordering Abu Hudaifa's wife to breastfeed a grown man, Malik's Muwatta, chapter 30, section 2, number 12, continues with this. Aisha, Umm al-Mu'minin, mother of the believers, took that as a precedent for whatever men she wanted to be able to come to see her. She ordered her sister, Umm Kulthum bin Abi Bakr as-Siddiq, and the daughters of her brother to give milk to whichever men she wanted to be able to come in to see her. The rest of the wives of the Prophet refused to let anyone come into them by such nursing. They said, No, by Allah, we think that what the Messenger of Allah ordered Sahla bin Suhail to do was only by an indulgence concerning the nursing of Salim alone. No, by Allah, no one will come in upon us by such nursing. We find the same thing in Sahih Muslim 3605, where Muhammad's wife, Umm Salama, declares, The other wives of the Prophet used to refuse to admit anyone on the basis of that breastfeeding of a grown-up. They said to Aisha, by Allah, we think that this is a concession which the Messenger of Allah granted only in the case of Salim. No one will enter upon us or see us on the basis of this type of breastfeeding. So, Muhammad's wives were claiming that the command to breastfeed adults only applied to Abu Hudaifa's wife in the case of Salim. This explanation obviously doesn't work for three reasons. One, there were two Quran verses about breastfeeding adults. Whichever verse was meant for Abu Hudaifa's wife, what was the other verse for? Two, we know that Abu Hudaifa's wife was told to breastfeed Salim five times. So the situation with Abu Hudaifa arose after the verse requiring ten breastfeedings had been abrogated. The verse requiring ten breastfeedings therefore couldn't have been revealed about Abu Hudaifa's wife. Three, as we've seen, Muhammad's wife Hafsa had her sister breastfeed a man ten times, which means that this was already being practiced before Abu Hudaifa became concerned about his wife and Salim. So there's no way the commands to breastfeed adults only applied in one specific case, and Muhammad's wives knew this. And yet they used their glaringly false interpretation to reject the practice. Apparently Muhammad's wives had more common sense than their husband and their god. They realized how silly it was for grown women to put their bare breasts into the mouths of grown men in an attempt to avoid sexual tension. They understood that it was absolutely ludicrous for Aisha to keep sending men to suck on her sister's and niece's breasts whenever she wanted to be alone with the men. And surprise, surprise, the verses commanding this practice, a practice Muhammad's wives found revolting, came up missing after he died someone conveniently left the sheep gate open. There are only two real possibilities here. Either Aisha remained faithful in her desire to preserve the Quran, and Muhammad's other wives conspired to send hungry sheep into Aisha's house to rid the world of one of history's most ridiculous teachings. Or, since Aisha had the only written copy of the verses, Muhammad's other wives may have eventually persuaded her to destroy them. I favor the latter explanation. While it's clear that Aisha initially approved of Allah's command to breastfeed adults, she was also very young and under the influence of Muhammad. When Muhammad died, Aisha was 18 years old, and by this time she had presumably learned that if a woman wants to avoid sexual tension, it's a good idea to keep her breasts out of men's mouths. But there's another piece of evidence that supports Aisha's involvement in the Sheepgate conspiracy. The sheep didn't just eat the Quran verses on breastfeeding adults. It also ate the Quran verse on stoning adulteresses. Aisha was once accused of adultery 
and if Muhammad hadn't received a special revelation proclaiming her innocence, she could have been stoned to death. The accusation of adultery was one of the reasons she became so careful about having her sister and nieces help her follow the breastfeeding rule. She was trying to protect herself. We don't need Sherlock Holmes to uncover Aisha's fear of the verse of stoning. And her sheep ate the only copy. Coincidence? No. Conspiracy. The verses on breastfeeding an adult, along with the verse of stoning, fell victim to one of history's least common means of malice. Death by sheep. For you Muslims who are watching, here are 10 takeaways. First, Muhammad's wives knew more about human nature than Allah did. So Muhammad's wives were greater in knowledge than Allah. Second, in the Quran, Surah 15, verse 9, Allah promises to protect the Quran from corruption. And yet Muhammad's wives were able to destroy verses of the Quran. So Muhammad's wives were greater in power than Allah. So was the sheep. Your God couldn't protect the Quran from a sheep. Third, Muhammad's wives had the courage to remove this awful teaching from the Quran. So they were greater in goodness than Allah. Question. If Muhammad's wives were greater in knowledge, power, and goodness than Allah, why are you worshiping Allah? Fourth, if Muhammad's wives were willing to deliberately destroy verses of the Quran, it seems that they may have recognized that they were married to a false prophet. Unfortunately for them, since the penalty for leaving Islam is death, they had to keep quiet about their apostasy. Fifth, many Muslims today don't believe in the doctrine of abrogation, the doctrine that some Quran verses abrogate or cancel other Quran verses. And yet your most trusted sources are filled with examples of Quran verses abrogating other Quran verses. Why do modern Muslim beliefs so frequently contradict orthodox Islamic doctrine? Six, you believe that the Quran is an eternal tablet in heaven. But notice that this eternal tablet is incoherent. One verse of the eternal Quran says that 10 breastfeedings are required to make a man a mahram. Another verse of the eternal Quran says that five breastfeedings are required to make a man a mahram. The Quran is eternally incoherent. Seventh, the Quran you read today is different from the eternal Quran. Which one's better? Eighth, your Muslim leaders tell you that the Quran has been perfectly preserved, even though they've read the same sources I keep quoting to you. Your leaders know that, according to your most trusted sources, entire chapters of the Quran were lost, large passages of the Quran were lost, verses were lost, phrases were lost. And yet they tell you that the Quran has been perfectly preserved right down to the letter from the time it was revealed to Muhammad. They tell you this because it gives you confidence in the Quran. But your confidence is based on deception. Ninth, if your leaders keep lying to you about the history of the Quran, what else are they lying to you about? Tenth, if your leaders are the ones who are lying to you, and I'm the one who's telling you the truth, why do you get mad at me?